Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Tracy, I have to ask you a question right out of the gate. I'm putting you on the spot. Okay. The Adams Family or the Munsters? Oh, man. So when I was a kid, I loved the Adams Family most, and I thought the Munsters were a weird knockoff. That's not accurate. <laughs> no, but that, uh, but that's valid to think that. Um, I will probably shock you by saying when I was a kid, I liked the Munsters more. Really? I did. It was not until I got older that I kind of switched it over. And I think I realized I was trying to figure out why that was, and I think it was an aspirational ghouldom where I uh-huh. knew I could never be like the long, willowy Morticia, but I could probably pull off a lily. Oh, um, <laughs> sure. Like Yvonne de Carlo with her little white stripe in her hair, and she was shorter, and she had that fabulous ruched dress and the bat necklace. And so I think that was what it was. But I liked them both. Yeah. And now I love them both. But today we are going to talk about Charles Adams, who was the creator of the Adams Family as a cartoon long before it was ever a TV series or films, etc. And Charles Adams was, by all accounts, a really compelling figure. He visited cemeteries for fun, and he was a car enthusiast, and he raced cars as an amateur, and he collected and shot crossbows. And Alfred Hitchcock once just showed up on his doorstep with no advance warning, hoping to meet him and saying, when Charles Adams opened the door, I've just come to see you in your natural bailiwick. But Adams very likely surprised the filmmaker because he surprised a lot of people who thought they could intuit what the creator of the kinds of cartoons he made would be like because he was not an elusive sort of proto-goth at all. He was, in fact, very dapper and sociable, and he was irreverent, but by all accounts, completely delightful to be around. Uh, And there is so much great stuff to his story that this is a two-parter. So um, we had to talk about all of his good and bad qualities. And also, I will just say that after doing all this research, if I build a time machine, my answer might have changed again, because I just want to go back and maybe um, have cocktails with Charles Adams. (laughs) I think he would be just a super fun guy to hang out with. I also feel like this is an interesting, um, not exactly counterpoint, but that's the word that I can think of, to last Halloween's Edward Gorey episode. Yeah. They, they in terms of them both uh, having sort of a macabre fascination in their work and having very distinctive personalities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it it's interesting. Uh, it it doesn't come up in either of these episodes, but naturally people would ask him a little bit about Gory um, and other artists as well, cartoonists, and and he always felt that. Um, uh, and I'm paraphrasing based on stuff that I read that to him he was just to Charles Adams he just thought he was funny. He didn't really see himself necessarily as macabre at all, whereas he really thought that Edward Gorey had this insight into like the darker side of humanity. And he was like, I just draw funny stuff, <laughs> 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 which is kind of interesting because a lot of his stuff, at least for the time, it was very dark. Nowadays, it's probably considered pretty mild by comparison, but it has sort of a wonderful. An unexpected nature of how it looks at the world and humanity and that some people often found a little bit dark or a lot dark. Yeah. So we'll start at the beginning, as we usually do. Charles Samuel Adams was born in Westfield, New Jersey on January 7th, 1912. His father, Charles Huey Adams, had studied to be an architect, but then ended up working at a piano company. He worked his way up from a salesman to an executive, and he really traveled a lot. The young Charles's mother was Grace M. Spear Adams, and he went by the name Charlie. By all accounts, he was a very jolly baby, and the Adamses had this blue-eyed child a little late considering the time. Grace was in her 30s when he was born, and they really just treasured him. Yeah, there's a great story in in the biography that I read of him that she initially was very nervous and she bought a baby book and was doing, and she eventually just threw it out because she was like, I just love this kid and we're just going to raise him that way. Um, Like that will be their guiding principle. Uh, He was also really fascinated as a kid by some of the old rundown Victorian homes in their neighborhood. And when he was eight, Charlie and a number of other boys broke into one that was under renovation and they drew skeletons on the walls and they caused all kinds of other mischief. They 
messed with the some of the the paint and resins that the construction workers had left behind. And this got them in a little bit of trouble with the local police. Adams liked to tell people that he got arrested at the age of eight for trespassing and vandalism, but there was actually no arrest. Uh, The kids were instead rounded up, and they were taken to the courthouse, and Mr. Adams, Charlie's father, paid for the damages that the boys had done. This is like an episode of the Andy Griffith show. (laughs) It totally is. A lot of his life sounds like that growing up. He always stressed what a normal, sort of wholesome, happy boyhood he had. Yeah, later on as a young man, he really did get arrested, though. He was arrested when he removed the tank top part of his swimsuit at the beach after having seen a photo of Italian men who were wearing their swimsuits with just the shorts on. (laughs) Yes, for emulating fashion, he uh, got in a little bit of legal trouble. Charlie did remain fascinated with Victorian homes after his childhood even, but during his childhood, he liked to wander the streets of their town where there were a lot of them, and he would imagine the secrets of the people who lived there and thought about the sinister possibilities of the things in their lives they might be hiding. But his own family, like I said, was pretty happy and even pretty ordinary. His parents were devoted to one another, and he sometimes joked that he was strange because he didn't have an unhappy childhood. He was a much-beloved child, and he also really loved his parents. The only thing that seemed to darken this picture of perfection and happiness was that his mother would get lonely when his father traveled for work. Long past that home break-in, Charles continued to be a prankster. He liked to use the dumbwaiter in the family home to sneak into his grandmother's room and then jump out and scare her. Something that he admitted doing. (laughs) The same maternal grandmother, Emma Louise Tufts Spear, would go on to inspire the grandma character in his famous work as an adult. And it was through her that Charlie was related to not only the Tufts family, but also very distantly to John Adams. Yeah, so that's the other side of the family, not the Adams from whence his name comes, which is a 2D situation, um, as in it has two Ds in it. (laughs) But uh, yeah, so he had a, a pretty illustrious family set of connections on his mother's side. He also would say that uh, in inspiring the grandmother later on in Adam's family, that was his grandmother, like, when she first woke up in the morning and hadn't combed her hair, she was not always disheveled. (laughs) But even as a kid, there were also some clues that Charlie was really in tune with the macabre. So in addition to thinking about those secret lives of the people in the houses around him, he adored things like skeletons and coffins and even Iron Maidens. At one point, he said he really believed that if he had told his parents he wanted an Iron Maiden, they probably would have bought one for him. Uh, But some of his fascination with such things actually came from his fear of them. He was actually pretty claustrophobic. He wrote about it as a kid in his diary, and he was afraid of snakes. But instead of trying to avoid those things, he confronted them, and he drew his fears to deal with them. One of the things that comes up over and over when you read about his house as an adult is that he had all kinds of snake art in it, so he clearly really embraced that fear. (laughs) He also really loved art. He started drawing as a kid, and his parents encouraged him in it. Even when Charlie was still very young, younger than seven, he was drawing pictures of World War I as it took place. He was imagining the scenes that he heard about in news reports, and he also liked to draw a lot of pictures of Kaiser Wilhelm II being killed in all kinds of ways. He was hanged, he was run over by a car, on and on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he uh, drew everything he heard. And Grace and Charles really believed that their child had a true and unique talent, so much so that at one point, Grace brought some of his drawings to H.T. Webster at the New York Herald and said, look at my child and what he can do. But Webster was like, this kid has no talent. It's such a common story among parents, being like, my kid is amazing. And another non-related person is like, not really, though. (laughs) Throughout all of his education, Charlie was a lot more likely to draw humorous cartoons during class than to take notes. And even in drawing class, he would hurry through assignments and then scribble his humorous cartoons for the rest of the class period. I did this all through school, but it was with reading. (laughs) His classmates found him to be fascinating and fun, and he really never lacked for company when he wanted it. Yeah, he was one of those kids, uh, it's been described, that kind of fit in with everybody. Like, he didn't have one clique. He had kind of people from each clique that also hung out with him. 
Uh, and at this point, though, he still thought, like, art was probably a good plan, but that he was going to be, like, a commercial illustrator. He didn't think all of this doodling and cartooning would amount to much of anything. And after graduating from Westfield High School, he enrolled in Colgate College in Hamilton, New York. And this was actually a really difficult transition for his mother, who was now often without her traveling husband and her son, who was away at college. In his sophomore year, Adams transferred to University of Pennsylvania, but what he thought was going to be an art program that would more closely suit his needs actually turned out to be more of an architecture program. He only lasted a year there. He never finished his undergraduate degree. And when he left college, he started taking classes at the Grand Central School of Art in New York. And this school still proudly lists him as an alumnus, but he only stayed there a year. In 1931, he drew a sketch of a window washer from an aerial point of view and then on a whim dropped it off at the New Yorker offices. Like you do. He left it in an envelope, but he didn't include a return address on it. And then several months later, he went back to the New Yorker hoping to just pick up his sketch and he found out that it had been published in the space at the end of a column. That's what's called a decorative spot. It was in the February 6th, 1932 issue. He got a check for $7.50, and he was 20 when this happened. (laughs) Yeah, he apparently went running to show one of his friends, a young lady that he had met in art school that that, uh, he had become close friends with, this check, and she actually thought he had forged it. She's like, no, you didn't. (laughs) Well, the idea of a person just dropping something off at the New Yorker office and then having it published (laughs) spontaneously, like, that's pretty (laughs) far-fetched. Yeah, Uh, But just a few months after this this joyous milestone, Charlie's father died at the age of 58. And that sudden death, it wasn't entirely sudden, but he became ill very quickly and died not long thereafter. It really catalyzed a change for Charlie. He kind of realized at that point that school was never going to give him what he needed, and he just wanted to go ahead and start earning a living. And so to that end, he took a job retouching crime scene photos for True Detective magazine. So in this case, he would sometimes make them a little less gory and gruesome before publication, or he would just do layouts where he had to add uh, captions or um, any descriptive text on the image to to further explain it to readers. He made $15 a week, and that wasn't super great money, but it was a really secure job during the Depression, which was a very difficult thing to find. He submitted to The New Yorker again. This time it was a sketch of a hockey player who forgot his skates, and he's standing on the ice with his colleagues in his stocking feet. This was published on January 4th, 1933. And he'd later talk about how unfunny this piece of art was and wonder why the magazine ever went for it. He continued to submit cartoons to The New Yorker, and several more were published that year. 1934 was leaner, though. The magazine only published one of his cartoons. In 1935, he submitted an image of a printing press that was running a paper with the headline, Sex Fiend Slays Tot. He submitted that to The New Yorker, and The New Yorker published it on March 23rd of 1935. It was a skewering of the press and the tendency to run just the most lurid stories possible on the front page. And from that point, Adams, who had already started signing his art Chaz Adams simply because he liked how it looked, he didn't actually go by Chaz in his life, uh, started to get a little more brazen with the dark subjects of his cartoons. He did routinely get notes that his drawing needed to be better. And so he started working with ink washes, which added a lot of depth to his images. And he started selling a lot more art and making more money. Coming up, we will talk more about Charlie's early work for The New Yorker. But first, we're going to take a little break so we can hear from one of our sponsors. By 1935, at the age of 23, Adams was regularly publishing with The New Yorker as a contributor. That was a job that ended up really defining his career and the public's relationship with his work. This wasn't a huge money gig. He got paid $10 for spots, those little smaller ones that were kind of fillers, and a fee per square inch for larger images, which wasn't great money, it wasn't a high-volume business, and there was no guarantee that submitted work was going to be accepted. And he also submitted to other publications during this time and got published in some of them, but The New Yorker was his primary source of income. And as his popularity with readers grew, the magazine started getting requests to purchase his original drawings. And then on January 1st of 1938, he had his first cover with the magazine. Not all of Adam's drawings were his own ideas. 
He collaborated with writers at The New Yorker for some of his work, and he hired gag writers on his own as well. That included Richard McAllister. This was a really common practice, and at the time, The New Yorker ran its cartoon division around this idea of writers and artists working as collaborators. Yeah, sometimes people are a little shocked, and I know even later in life, as like sort of the next generation of artists was coming up in The New Yorker, many of whom had been idolizing Charles Adams, they were like, what do, what do, you, what do you mean he didn't write those jokes? And it would be like, no, he would get somebody sometimes to write the joke, and then he would illustrate the joke. It's like an actor uh, with a script. Uh, so it's a little startling for some people. Uh, Morticia Adams first appeared in print on August 6th of 1938, although she did not have that name at the time. She kind of got called all manner of things like ghoulish woman or, you know, creepy woman. Still, her trademark long, elegant look is unmistakable, although her hair is pulled back in that one. She is being given a pitch by a vacuum salesman, while a large, imposing butler, a bat, and a mysterious figure upstairs all look on. And the scene plays out against what is obviously a cobwebby haunted house background. And Adams, who just called the work vacuum cleaner when he recorded it in his own personal records, was paid $85 for it. And he had absolutely no idea where that was eventually going to lead. Harold Ross, who was the co-founder and editor-in-chief at The New Yorker, saw something in this, though. He asked Adams to fill the Victorian house he had created for the vacuum cleaner cartoon with more characters. Things evolved immediately. The butler went from this bearded man who, to the very clean-shaven look that was reminiscent of Frankenstein's monster, as that character looks in James Whale's films. The surroundings got more dilapidated and creepier, but new characters didn't appear. But Harold Ross still liked it, though, and it ran in the magazine in November of 1939, more than a year after that first ghoulish vacuum cleaner sale. <laughs> and then on January 12th of 1940, The New Yorker published one of Adams's most famous non-Adams family cartoons. It's kind of nicknamed The Ski Tree, or you'll see it referred to as The Skier. And it features a skier who has just passed a tree. And the skier's ski tracks can clearly be seen going around each side of the tree uninterrupted. And the skier is continuing on. And then a witness in the form of a cross-country skier traveling in the opposite direction looks on in bewilderment. Uh, as though he doesn't know quite how this person went around a tree <laughs> on its skis from both sides. Uh, it perfectly encapsulates Charles Adams's sense of the absurd and the mind-bending, and Adams became pretty instantly famous for the skier, which surprised him greatly. He thought it was just an incredibly simple cartoon, and he couldn't quite grasp why people wanted to analyze it so tirelessly for meaning. It got written up by professors. People wrote, you know, their thesis on it. He heard about it being taught in, like, logic classes, and he was like, it's just a weird cartoon, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and my embarrassing admission for this episode uh, is that I didn't really, like, I'm familiar with that cartoon. I'm see, I've seen it plenty of times before. When I read the description in this outline, I could immediately call it to mind. And I did not make the connection ever that that was the same guy as the Adams Family. I can understand that. I mean, it's, it's an early stage of when he was doing ink washes, so it didn't mm -hmm. have that same level of depth. And it is not... It's weird, and like I said, it's a little mind-bendy, but it, there's nothing of the, the sort of creepy stuff that we more closely tie to him. So the 1940s were really eventful for Adams. In 1940, he illustrated the book But Who Wakes the Bugler by Peter DeVries. Two years later, he published his own anthology drawn and quartered at Random House. And after that, he was constantly publishing. He had a lot of books. Um, that elegant woman in Adams's dark Victorian house, who would later become Morticia, fell in love, almost in tandem with Charles Adams. The artist came up with a round, old-fashioned-looking paramour for his macabre lady, as his life was becoming entwined with that of Barbara Jean Day. Barbara, who went by Bobby, is often described as looking like Morticia though Adams at various times would list all of the many ways that they were different. In early 1943, so World War II, uh, Adams was drafted into the U.S. Army. And just a month after he joined, his mother died at 66, which was incredibly rough on him. Three months later, perhaps to try to reclaim a little bit of happiness, on May 29th, Charlie took leave to marry Bobby in Westfield. They honeymooned in Manhattan, and then Charlie returned to the base that he was stationed at, which was just in Astoria. 
Barbara set up their new home in an apartment at 36th and a half East 75th Street. And she also started to look even more like Charlie's cartoon ghoul woman. She grew out her hair, which was very dark, and she started wearing a lot of black. Because Charlie's barracks were nearby, the couple saw a lot of each other, and they socialized with other couples as well. Yeah, this isn't a time where they were, like, separated during his service time. He stayed on the base, but it was apparent that many of the the soldiers who were stationed there that had wives or girlfriends often left at night. He certainly was having dinners with friends and colleagues during this time. Uh, but because of his art background, Charlie was selected to work at the Signal Corps Photographic Center, making training films and pamphlets and signs and similar types of things for the military. And during this time, he was also still submitting regularly to The New Yorker. He occasionally produced war theme art, usually at the request of an editor, but he mainly stayed true to his own grim humor and subjects. He wanted his work to be timeless and not tied to the era in which it was drawn. And the children of the little monstrous family who would evolve into Pugsley and Wednesday appeared during this time as well. Charlie's army time ended in 1946 after the war was over, and he started a life that was really pretty glamorous. Adams had moved into a nicer apartment. He started buying cars and unique antiques. He purchased a farm, spent months on Fire Island, and partied with friends, including old friends and new friends, some of whom were very high profile in the art or writing scene. Yeah, it seemed like he and Bobby really had, like, that sort of charmed... Uh, artsy power couple life where they just hung out with everybody cool. They hosted the coolest parties. He was busy getting into to racing his expensive cars at this point. And in December of 1946, the New Yorker published one of the most famous of the Adams Family cartoons called Boiling Oil. And this features an angled aerial view of a Victorian mansion with a group of carolers clustered at the bottom of the image at the door. They're kind of small in the picture. Lurch, Gomez, and Morticia, again, not named this yet, but it's easier to do that for shorthand, are standing on a ledge near the top of the house, and they have a vat of boiling oil tipped just before it spills out onto the Merry Singers. Huge numbers of requests came in from fans after this was published, asking if they could use it on their Christmas cards. And Adams always granted permission so long as they were just doing it for personal use and they were not mass-producing it for sale. Charlie really embraced the ghoulish, eccentric identity that his fans seemed to want him to have. He went on picnics and graveyards and even snatched an old gravestone, which he later used as a table. Please do not steal gravestones. (laughs) His home filled up with ghoulish odds and ends, and he got all manner of odd and creepy gifts. He would tell reporters and friends about them, and he was very conscious of how they added to this whole macabre mystique. These things included stuff like a human thigh bone and a skull that was gilded with gold. Yeah, all kinds of things. The human thigh bone I have seen relate in two different ways. One, that it was a gift from a fan, and one, that it was a gift from one of his wives. But I never saw, like, conclusive corroboration of either of those, so but he had one. Um, By the late 1940s, though, what had started as a small issue in the Adams marriage loomed progressively larger. Bobby enjoyed their life, but she really wanted to slow things down a little bit and start a family. Charlie found it challenging enough to be in a monogamous marriage, and that was something that he never quite managed to do. And he did not want to add children to the equation. He was absolutely great with kids. He enjoyed playing with kids. His friends' kids all loved him. But he thought having one of his own in his life was going to really limit his options and basically just prevent him from living the life he wanted. And he later would say when this topic would come up, I'm my own child. Eventually, Charlie agreed that they could have a baby, but they weren't able to conceive. Bobby wanted to adopt a child, and Charles agreed on the condition that they get an older child and not an infant. But then when a child fitting their application finally became available, Charlie got cold feet about it, and he couldn't complete the paperwork, and this ended their marriage. Bobby left shortly thereafter with another man. Yeah, so they had had eight years where they seemed like the perfect couple, and then it ended rather abruptly. Uh, And that same summer that the marriage ended, Charlie's best friend and fellow cartoonist died. That was Sam Cobain, and he died suddenly in a car accident. And Adams actually felt somehow responsible for the death because he had been the person who got Sam interested in cars. And even though he was not driving dangerously, I guess he was driving kind of fast down a straightaway when another car entered and hit his car. 
And Bobby and Charlie attended Sam's funeral as a couple. It was their one last appearance as a married couple. Despite all these personal setbacks, Charlie's professional life was continuing to flourish. Not only were there more books, but also merchandise. There was a line of Chaz Adams scarves and housewares that was launched in the early 1950s. He also worked on an assortment of projects with his friends. Yeah, some of those came to fruition and some did not, but he always just had fun kind of noodling around with other people on collaborations and projects. And it turned out that Adams's penchant for dark humor really connected with readers. He already knew that based on that whole Christmas card thing, but it continued to snowball. He got fan mail from all over, and at one point he told James Thurber, quote, I have gotten a lot of letters about my work, most of them from criminals and subhumans who want to sell ideas. Some of the worst come from a minister in Georgia. And all kinds of rumors are also started to follow him around this time, like that he slept in a coffin and sometimes that he would put eyeballs in his martinis. Those were untrue. But the legendary tales of his drinking and womanizing that started around this time were absolutely based in reality. He was really fun-loving and famous, and once his divorce became public knowledge, he was like a magnet for prospective dates. He dated some women regularly, and there were rumors of some possible engagements, but he was never exclusive with anyone. Yeah, the list of women that he was almost maybe engaged to is mighty long. I mean, we're talking dozens. (laughs) And then he met a woman named Barbara Barb in 1953. And her full name was actually Estelle B. Barb. And she was a tall, dark-haired, flashy beauty. She looked to a lot of his friends like an ultra-glamorized version of Charlie's first wife, Bobby. He very clearly had a type. Some of his friends really perceived her rather unkindly. She was described by some of them as a bimbo. But in fact, Barb was smart as a whip and very ambitious, and she had what seemed to be a very successful law career. She did have a legitimate law degree, but she also embellished her own life story in ways that made it really hard to discern how much she was a self-made success and whether she may have gotten her money from other means. But regardless of how anyone else saw Barbara Barb, Charles Adams was completely captivated by her. But one aspect of their courtship was always consistently relayed. Based on accounts of all of Charlie's friends and Charlie, it was a really tumultuous relationship. Charlie confided in friends at various points that Barbara was sometimes violent when they fought, hitting him and brandishing a knife at one point. They also ended up having a number of false starts on wedding dates. They would plan to get married, and then they would get in a big fight, and it would fall apart, and they would just do that cycle over and over. But they still did get married in South Carolina at the end of 1954. The marriage, like the courtship, was really a roller coaster. Barbara lied to Charlie about being pregnant when she wasn't. She told him that she had no family when it turned out that she did, and they were nearby in Brooklyn. Police had to intervene in fights between the two of them on occasion, and throughout all of it, it turned out that Barbara had maintained a romance with a man in England who she saw whenever she was traveling to Europe, which was a frequent part of her work. And the New Yorker at this time had first rights to any of Charlie's cartoons, as outlined in a contract that had been put in place in the 1940s. Barbara Barb set up a company of her own that would manage the sale and distribution of any work that the New Yorker had not taken. And under this setup, Barbara was paid to manage the arrangement and manage his art, and she was entitled to 50% of the earnings from these sales. This marriage and all kinds of aspects of their relationship were completely confusing to everyone in Adam's social circle, and we'll talk a bit more about that after we take a quick sponsor break. So as we said before we cut to our sponsor break, no one really understood this marriage, which, as it turns out, was not even common knowledge. For reasons that are a little unclear, Barbara, who Charlie's friends nicknamed Bad Barbara since they called his first wife Good Barbara, which is kind of a stinky situation to be in, but uh, she wanted to keep the wedding a secret for a while. And of course, there were tons of rumors about why she might want that, but we don't really know. But Charles also seemed a little afraid of his second wife, and he was willing to give in to her various demands just to keep the peace and hopefully keep their various problems from getting out and damaging his career. 
But he wasn't cowed or submissive. From very early on, he was taking delivery of love letters that were arriving from Barbara's British lover and then taking those to his lawyers for safekeeping without ever telling Barb that he had them. I feel like this is the inspiration for a whole storyline on parks and recreation. (laughs) It absolutely could be the inspiration of so many different genres of drama, comedy, and horror. (laughs) Well, it's specifically the multiple wives with the same name. Yeah. (laughs) Um, With one of them being the particularly bad one. So then in October of 1955, Barbara insisted that Charlie take out a $100,000 life insurance policy that named her as its irrevocable beneficiary. Charlie talked to a lawyer, and then he went along with the policy. He and Barbara went into couples counseling. He also, though, hired an investigator to follow Barbara's activities in England, and he told friends that he thought that Barbara was trying to kill him. The marriage finally ended in 1956 with Barbara asking for the rights to 50 of Charlie's cartoons and ownership of some of his properties. She promised that she would return the real estate to him in her will. He happily agreed, thinking this was a relatively painless way to escape this whole marriage, And after a quickie divorce, Barbara immediately left for England and moved in with her lover there. Incidentally, their quickie divorce, which happened in Alabama, uh, at a time where Alabama was the place you went to for a quickie divorce, because you you could just stand there and say, yes, I'm a resident of Alabama, and no one would question it, and then they would do the legal proceeding. Allegedly, their divorce took like 45 minutes. And a lot of people were doing exactly the same thing. But this became high profile enough that people were like, wait a minute, we got to change the laws. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this, is, this is way too easy. We can't be like the divorce destination. And his legal team that he would consult was always like, don't do this. Don't sign anything she gives you. And he would be like, you're right. And then he would go back and sign it. Um, <laughs> but uh, finally, he thought he was free. And by the end of 1956, Charlie had started an affair with a woman named T. Davy, who was his friend's wife and was also very pregnant at the time. Uh, and this happened when he visited them in Tennessee during the holidays. T, whose name was Marilyn Matthews, but she had gone by T since she was a kid, had known Charlie for about nine years at that point. She had been introduced through her husband, Buddy Davy, who was an heir to the Standard Oil fortune. And this affair was not very serious for either of them. T's marriage was struggling at the time, although they were working on things with a therapist, and Charlie was still dealing with his divorce. It was a brief and casual dalliance. But a deepening friendship grew between the two of them as Charles stayed there in Tennessee with the very pregnant T while Buddy traveled for work. Meanwhile, Barbara, who had remarried but not told Charlie about it, once again appeared in his life. The two started trying to see each other socially when she was in New York, and it's been theorized that he was possibly trying to make nice with her in order to get his properties back, but he always remained really unfathomably friendly to her. Yeah, his friends all had theories about why he might have social dates with her, and that was one of them. That was kind of the summation was, uh, maybe he's trying to get his stuff back. We don't know. Is she blackmailing you? (laughs) Right. Because she did seem a little snaky. Um, He also had a project during this time called Dear Dead Days, which was published in 1959. And this was a concept book. And the concept was that it was the memory album of the Adams family. And it featured photographs that tied to their world and inspired the cartoons that he had drawn of them. But there are only a few pieces of his artwork within it. Some of the photographs were eerie and unsettling, and it was not what people expected. (laughs) It was not what his fans wanted, and this book did not sell very well. But Adams thought it was great. He felt like this was a very fulfilling artistic endeavor. Incidentally, maybe informed by these two failed marriages, Charles wanted it never to be actually stated in captions or images that his gothic bride and her odd, rotund paramour were married as these characters that he was starting to form into a group in these cartoons. Yeah, they never were a family initially in his mind. They were just, like, odd ghouls that lived together. (laughs) Uh, And it wasn't until the press started calling them, actually, Adams's family that they started to take on that tone. Despite the lackluster reception of Dear Dead Days and the end of this really bad, though brief, marriage, Charles Adams was entering a stage of his life that was, again, sort of like the epitome of a glamorous, successful party lifestyle. We are going to talk about all of that and, of course, the Adams family's transition from the page to the screen on our next episode. Uh, 
I have listener mail. It's a brief listener mail, but it felt like it tied into this because it is from one of our younger listeners, and it has a drawing on it. <laughs> and he writes, Can you do an episode on the Odenbach Castle? My ancestors owned it. I am also named after it. This is from our listener, Odin, who drew a beautiful castle at the bottom. Uh, I'll put it on my list. You never know when those might pop up. Everything's in sort of a long list, constant rotation situation where it depends when we find resources and and when things just work out with our schedule. But I will put it on the list, Odin, I promise you. Uh, if you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. You can also find us pretty much everywhere on social media as Missed in History. And mistinhistory.com is also where you'll find our website where you can get any episode of the show that has ever existed as well as uh, occasional other goodies. And you should do that at mistinhistory.com. You can also subscribe to this show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever it is you get your podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 